Lately, I've been getting a lot of comments that are all basically asking the same question, which is, why weren't shields generally used by the armies of the 18th century? Now, I say generally because I, I, I know that you're out there, Lucas, and you're ready to pounce with some really cool images and sources about how some units of, for example, Spanish cavalry actually did use shields, uh, and I'm sure that there are a lot of other examples besides if you really dive in deep. Uh, after all, the world is a very big place, and the hundred plus years of the long 18th century is a long time. There are always exceptions. But for the most part, the infantry, the European infantry and European style of this time period were not carrying any form of portable cover, uh, despite there being a number of different scenarios which people have you know, brought, uh, brought up to me uh, where they feel that they would be useful. And that's the specific topic that I'm going to cover in this video. Why weren't shields used? Uh, was it because military leaders of the time were not aware of their potential benefits? Uh, perhaps they were angered by a dishonorable prospect of taking cover in such a way. Uh, or perhaps were there more practical considerations at play? Just how effective a tool could they have been on an 18th century battlefield? Well, for starters, let's talk about penetration. Is it possible for a shield to stop a musket ball? And that's going to depend an awful lot on a number of different factors. Uh, the size of the ball, the range at which it has been fired, and of course the angle at which it hits the shield, and probably you know tons of other things uh, all involving you know big numbers and physics and all that that I can't even comprehend with my liberal arts education. But uh, what I do know is that there was armor during this time period which was proofed to withstand musket shot, uh, typically in the form of heavy cavalry breastplates. Uh, now, obviously, they wouldn't be stopping anything fired out of, say, a cannon, even if it's just smaller rounds like canister shot or whatever, uh, and they probably have a tough time against a 70 caliber musket ball being fired at 10 yards. But, uh, I don't know, a pistol shot, maybe? Or a musket that was fired from, you know, one or two hundred yards away? Well, now there's a pretty solid chance that this armor can deflect the blow or even outright absorb it, leaving the uh, person wearing it more or less unscathed, maybe some bruising. Uh, so why not carry that same logic onwards to make a shield of, of iron or steel with a similar strength to those breastplates, uh, maybe with a strong wooden backing to reinforce it and make it all stronger. You know, whatever the, again, the science and the metallurgy and blah, blah, blah would look like, why not take that same logic and make something like a shield for the troops? Uh, make them, you know, the size of like an old Roman scutum, you know, uh, more or less like, uh, you know, the size of the person who's carrying it, uh, or an even better comparison actually may be like a modern day riot shield. Uh, then the front rank can kneel, and form a great big shield wall going all the way along behind which the musketeers, you know, standing behind that shield can pop up, take their shot, and then kneel when reloading. Now, sure, that shield is going to be very heavy, and it's not like they'd be invulnerable either, but that could save an awful lot of lives, couldn't it? Uh, give these otherwise totally exposed infantry units just standing there in the open some level of protection and keep them fighting longer, right? Well, not quite. Uh, as cool as that mental image is of like a Roman shield wall with musketeers behind it, as compelling an idea as it seems, there are a number of mitigating factors which would prevent it from ever being a practical military doctrine during the 18th century. And most of them, uh, I think, can be divided into two categories, being tactical and, of course, logistical. We'll start first by looking at the tactical limitations. For starters, a soldier with a musket cannot effectively wield a shield of any useful size or even really find the time to employ it. As you can see, a musket is a pretty long and somewhat cumbersome firearm. You can ignore the, ignore the poppy there, but uh, there's this lock sticking out of the side and uh, it's very sharp as well. You don't want to give yourself a scar like I once did uh, by touching it in the wrong way. And regardless of what system of drill you're using, the actual loading and firing of a musket, it's a very full-bodied thing. It's always going to take both hands and some level of movement of the body going from one direction to another as you're casting the weapon about, things like that. You need open space to get it done. 
and um, there's no opportunity for you to be holding a shield out in front of you. You know, if you're trying to like, you know, hold a shield out in front of you, which incidentally that's going to get in the way, so be more like at an angle, while also trying to load, it, it's not going to work. Uh, it also wouldn't be a good uh, combination in melee fighting, where the musket is going to be a lot more unwieldy if you're comparing it with, you know, say, a spear. Uh, it's not as well weighted or shaped for melee combat. Maybe you hold it upside down, you can get a grip sort of like that, you know, something like that. But even then, you're going to have a hard time really maneuvering it around to turn it into... It's not a spear. You're not going to get any sort of, you know, cool hoplite style action uh, with a musket and, and, a, and, a, and a shield. So, in order to make this work, odds are you're going to need a division of labor. Your front rank is going to be the one carrying the shields. They're going to be kneeling to form, again, a great big shield wall, while the rear ranks are ducking behind that wall and popping up to, bang, exchange fire before going back down. Maybe, um, whew, I'm out of breath from all this moving around. Uh, now, maybe you can give the uh, guys in the shield wall uh, like some pistols or spears, you know, something to give them a little bit of offensive power as well. Uh, in which case, you know, perfect, there you go. You have movable cover with an extra advantage against enemy cavalry and melee troops, right? Eh, not, not really, not quite. Um, right off the bat, by doing this, you're sacrificing anything from a quarter to up to half of your unit's potential firepower, depending on how many ranks the formation has. Uh, now sure, if the shield bearers have pistols, admittedly, they could do something at range, but the overall firepower, you know, the stopping power of a pistol, the range of a pistol, all that sort of stuff, that's going to be dramatically lessened that way. Uh, you know, you might also say, uh, rather than taking muskets away from the front rank, Rather, you're adding an additional rank to the infantry unit that already exists. Thus, you're not losing any firepower at all, you're just adding strength to the unit. But, well then, you're just making the units themselves that much larger, and you're taking men away from other uh, potential, you know, potentially more important roles. Regardless of how you want to spin it, it's going to be, if you're doing this sort of thing, a significant portion of the army that's employed with the primary function of being a shield bearer over a musket man or anything else. And sure, perhaps initially those shields would really, you know, help the unit to uh, stand their ground, help them to, um, you know, withstand additional fire, uh, even against an enemy that maybe they have more muskets because they didn't use the shields or whatever. There'd be some value there, right? Uh, uh, but really the advantage would only come at uh, uh, an extended range when the musketry is going to be less effective anyways. The closer the opponent gets to your shield wall, the more and more rounds are going to be well aimed and punching straight through those shields. The shield wall would be at its strongest when the muskets they're defending are at their weakest because the opponents are really far away, meaning that the opponent's rounds are you know, less uh, likely to penetrate. And in turn, when the enemy's muskets are at their most powerful, you know, when they're up nice and close and when your musketry can also have a really good impact, well, that's when the shield is going to be at its weakest, at, at, its, at its least useful. And that moment, when the enemy is really close and they're pouring on their accurate and numerically superior now firepower, well, that's when the guys with the new Swiss cheese shields, they're going to really start wishing that they had muskets instead. But then, as the enemy gets closer, well, maybe, maybe they launch a bayonet charge, or better yet, the side with the shields launches a bayonet charge, or in that case, a, you know, sword and board charge. Well, then, of course, there's going to be a clear advantage that I really can't dispense with. A man with a, a spear or a sword and a shield they're going to have a pretty good advantage over the guy with only a bayonet. But then the trouble is actually getting close enough to use that advantage, which often didn't happen because you're charging an enemy that is, well, they're shooting at you. Uh, thus we return to the old strength to distance ratio. And there's also the fact that in order for a man to be able to nimbly enough wield a shield in, you know, melee combat, I have no idea what I'm doing, I'm not a HEMA practitioner, but in order to be able to use that sword and board, 
the shield is going to have to be a little bit lighter than would be required to reliably stop those musket balls at an appropriate distance to make them work. The better the sword and board combo is gonna be at fighting against the bayonets, again, the weaker it's going to get at blocking the projectile, which is supposed to be the original function of it. And that's assuming that they could even reliably stop, stop the projectiles to begin with. And then there's cavalry. And I don't think I need to expound on the value of a shield wall against a charging cavalry force primarily because that value would be exactly the same as that of a regular infantry square. And given how rare it was to see a square broken, well, in that particular scenario, the shield just seems kind of superfluous. So on the whole, if you were a musketeer in this time period, would you want a shield bearer in front of you rather than another musket? Well, I mean, maybe, it, it depends. There are definitely a lot of different scenarios absolutely where it could save your life. But then there are plenty of other examples where it really wouldn't be that useful to you. It's important to remember that if you're a soldier, your individual life isn't what's really important, now is it? No individual firefight or, or, or melee struggle between two guys in larger formations, none of that is gonna be what the army really cares about. The army's primary job isn't to keep you alive, it's to win the objective. Now, sure, yes, keeping the soldiers alive is generally preferable and an important part of winning objectives. If everyone dies, you can't win the objectives. Nobody wants their men to die, but ultimately, so much of military doctrine, again, ultimately, it has to be a deadly arithmetic, doesn't it? We need to take that hill. How many lives is it going to cost us? And is that worth it? Only 100 men died? Yeah, all right, that, that's worth it because of wider considerations. The shield in front of you individually may save your life, but that doesn't mean that that soldier couldn't be better applied elsewhere with a musket. And at, this, at the uh, risk of getting ahead of myself here, um, let's pull back a little bit. We'll talk about mobility. As I've said, in order for this shield to actually withstand a musket shot at even a good distance, it's gonna have to be pretty thick and heavy. Dealing with uh, Wikipedia numbers here, so, so give it some salt, but a Roman scutum shield weighed around 22 pounds, being six millimeters thick and made of wood. Uh, I think there was like a metal uh, boss in the center, something like that, but it's primarily made of wood. It's not gonna stop a bullet, 22 pounds or so. Uh, presuming that these theoretical shields of ours are of a similar size, kind of like riot shield size, basically, uh, but with a lot more metal alongside the wood for, again, obvious reasons, uh, that shield is gonna get pretty heckin' heavy, especially when compared to a nine or so pound musket. Large shields means slower soldiers. They aren't able to march or run as quickly. They aren't able to deploy as rapidly. The entire line is going to be slowed down during an era in which quick and accurate maneuvering between large bodies of men was becoming increasingly important. I talked about that in the last video. Every time this unit moves, the bearers are gonna be picking up and lugging these shields around, attempting to keep up with the much more lightly equipped and much more rapidly moving musket men. They might all even need to uh, uh, be more mobile than the average soldier would because while a musket man could really be anywhere in the line and he's still able to perform his duty, the shield bearer needs to make sure that he's at the front. Uh, Otherwise, it's going to be useless. And this is also to say nothing of how strong a man would have to be, uh, not only to lug the shield around all day during the battle, but to actually use it. Think about it this way. They're holding up this 20, 30, however many pounds metal shield, and they're kneeling, bracing up against it, right? When the enemy fires a volley at 50 yards, 30 yards, something like that. You know, sometimes these fights could get really close. Usually they were, muskets are a lot more accurate than people give them credit for. It could be happening much further away, but like if they get in really nice and close when their accuracy is like really spot on, ignoring how some of those rounds are just gonna go over the shield and probably hit some targets anyways, and how tons of them are just gonna go right through the shield, imagine the force of the rounds that don't, say the shield works really, really well, or the enemy's like a little bit further away, whatever it is. Say it works really, really well, and it managed to actually stop a lot of those rounds. 
Imagine two, five, ten, seventy caliber musket balls slamming into this shield and just embedding themselves into it. The sheer kinetic force. It may just be enough to knock the man down outright anyways, thus again exposing the line to further fire. And that's to say nothing of how every round that does make it through, which again at closer range is going to be like a lot of them, every round that does make it through is not only going to represent a musket ball, but it's going to be a shower of wood and metal splinters as well. Think about how, you know, the, the majority of like casualties in like ship-based combat wasn't from the cannonball, it was from the splinters that those cannonballs caused. Not a fun time. And because the shield bearing unit is likely going to be moving a lot more slowly and how your army dedicated a significant portion of its manpower to providing that protection rather than separating them off into units of their own where they could, uh, you know, supply, you know, firepower themselves, you're also liable to be flanked. And to be fair, regardless of what happens on an 18th century battlefield, you're always going to be liable to be flanked because so much of warfare during the long 18th century was based around those sorts of principles. Uh, you know, over time, armies are not only getting much larger, they're getting more professional as well. And emphasis is being placed on their speed, their maneuverability, on, on penetrating an enemy's lines, turning their flanks, setting up enfilading fire, turning flanks, all that sort of fun stuff. I said turning flanks twice. It's really important. Linear warfare isn't just two sides lining up and taking turns shooting at each other. It's a highly mobile affair, and, and that means that if you want your shields to keep protecting you against those inevitable complications, you're going to need even more of your men using them to protect the flanks, maybe even the rear. That means more weight, less firepower, and less flexibility. And the same can be said for pretty much every form of cover and fortification. Why didn't armies use trench warfare in this time period? You know, you're going to be fighting in lines, may as well dig in before fighting in the lines, right? Why not, you know, always be using gabions, fascines, and chevaux de frise? Well, in all those cases, they did. They did use those things, but only when it made sense to do so. When battlefield conditions, uh, be it, you know, in a siege or, or in some sort of difficult terrain that prevented maneuvering, or whatever it is, whenever the, whenever the situation basically forces the opponent to attack from a set direction, and when an army had time to prepare those sorts of, you know, covered, fortified positions, then they'd be using them. But otherwise, if you're just fighting in a vast open field and you decide to dig in right on the spot, well, what's to prevent the enemy from just going around the trench? And, and if you're digging yourself into a circle where they can't just go around, well, why don't they just march right past your defenses? They'll burn down your countryside and your capital, and you're not going to be in any luck there. I mean, again, there are situations in which fortification makes sense. And when it made sense, it was used. This idea of fighting behind cover wasn't anything new, it wasn't seen as dishonorable or anything like that. It was very, very common, but only when it made sense. Now, all of this together, it just represents a few of the tactical considerations that I could think of. And I'm sure that there are a lot more that we could get into, like the fact that these shields would be pretty much useless against artillery, for example. But still, maybe you're not convinced. You feel that still there are advantages offered by a shield or a pavis or some other sort of cover that would outweigh the disadvantages. Uh, perhaps, for example, um, when a unit enters into melee combat or some other you know, specific scenario that I'm leaving out. Uh, you know, maybe if we, if we put the shields on the men's backs, well, sure, it wouldn't be a complete coverage uh, as much as a wall would be, but at the very least, it could provide some protection for the men when they turned around, uh, you know, they could turn around while reloading, and then they're protected in some way. That I mean, right? That, that's something, right? Surely there's some catch, there's some trick, there's some methodology, and I'm sure that many people are thinking of them as we speak, and many are being left in the comments section as well. There's some way to make this work that people just didn't realize back in the day, right? Well, now we come to our second category, one of the biggest reasons why none of those techniques ended up making it in the history books, and that being 
logistics. And we'll talk about logistics right after a word on behalf of our video sponsor, Exter. So we've gone on and on about how shields are not terribly practical in a tactical sense, but you know what is not only incredibly useful on the battlefield, but also heckin' tactical? It's even better than being tactical. That's right, it's the extra wallet. Now, I cannot promise that the extra wallet will stop a volley of musket fire, but it will stop an RFID theft attempt because of technology. I don't know how it works, but extra has it. And you know what else that technology can do? Well, not that technology, different technology, but they have technology for this also. That's right, it can find your wallet if you lose it by using a solar-powered card and a simple app. Oh, but Brandon, you'll point out to me, there's far more to military doctrine than just tactical things. You said it yourself, it's logistics that really matter at the end of the day. Yeah, 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 that's right, I know, but you know what? Extra wallets are logistical as all heck. Look at this sleek design. Cash cards, it carries it all and at a fraction of the size of your traditional bifold. And if you need a mass rapid deployment of your strongest assets, which is so incredibly important to be able to do on a battlefield, I don't know why we're still talking about battlefields, you get the idea. Well then look at that! Push the button, outslide the cards immediately. Not only will you be able to employ whichever piece of credit is most valuable to you at the time, but you're gonna look really heckin' cool doing it. Like, not making this up for the ad, I've actually been complimented like multiple times actually on the wallet in public because people like the little clicky click. They think it's cool, they think it's neat. Anyways. I really like my wallet, I love working with Exter, and I'm really glad that they decided to keep on sponsoring these videos. So visit the link in the description below to check out their spring sale from now until May 15th, where you can get up to 30% off site-wide by using my code BRANDONF. Now let's get back to those logistics. Let us begin, of course, with the cost. Armies during this time period are getting larger and larger, and like we said, these shields would have to be pretty thick. To supply them in significant enough numbers would take a lot of money, a lot of metal, and of course, a lot of manpower. Making a shield isn't just a case of riveting a steel plate onto some wood, there's an art to it, and that means specialists, smiths, just like you need a gunsmith for a musket and a blacksmith for a bayonet, you need a man who knows how to make those shields. And these are all forms of capital. Capital which could otherwise be deployed by an economy to producing cannon, musketry, ammunition, bayonets, all sorts of other delightful tools of war. Now, to be fair, if shields were indeed highly practical devices, if they worked consistently saving lives and winning battles, if they just made a unit stronger without significant drawbacks, then sure, yes, the cost would be worth it. I mean, flipping this thing is hardly the most reliable weapon ever created by man, but they were the best devices that they had at the time, and so despite the regular, you know, malfunctions, uh, you know, like what powder makes misfires a certainty, all that kind of stuff. Despite those inherent drawbacks, they were still mass produced and utilized despite their complexity, despite the expense, all that. It was worth it because a musket, well, it worked ultimately for the military's purposes. Every piece of military equipment has a, a massive logistical train. It's not like producing a shield is going to be inordinately more expensive than any other kind of equipment, right? But shields were not practical pieces of equipment in the majority of scenarios like, say, a musket or a bayonet would be. There simply wasn't enough of a use for them to justify the inherent levels of expense and logistical complexity that they would add. It's not just a matter of building the necessary infrastructure to produce the shields, it's also a matter of training up a separate corps of men in how to use them and making sure that they're deployed to the army in appropriate ways and blah, 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 blah. It's another large and very niche item to have to maintain in the field. And most important of all, it's just another thing in that field to start with. A heavy shield means a heavy burden on the, the men or the animals, or the carts, whatever, that have to carry them. That means a longer supply train. It means more strain on the logistical networks. As it is, these soldiers were often incredibly strained with the amount of equipment that they had to carry. 
their packs, you know, with extra clothing and personal items and the like, uh, you know, blankets and great coats, their haversacks, whatever weapons they would have on them, as well as certain pieces of kit and equipment uh, that were shared between the men, like uh, kettles, or if a soldier had a trade, like if he was the regimental, you know, uh, tailor or cobbler or whatever, he has to carry the tools of his trade, all these different things. And then on top of these already very heavy loads that the men are carrying to add a large, heavy metal shield onto his back alongside it all? I'm not even sure how he'd carry it alongside his pack. He'd have to be in his arms or some other crazy system would have to be invented for it. You know, as it is, there are plenty of examples of men just abandoning equipment, even vital equipment sometimes, along the roadside because they couldn't physically carry the extra weight when a campaign gets rough. Again, if these shields were a majorly important, really useful piece of equipment like the muskets, the bayonets and such, then the inherent cost of adding such a heavy bit of kit could be justified. Special carriages could be mocked up uh, to be pulled by the men. Various little innovations that could have made them lighter, maybe. You know, different kinds of packs to fit over top of those shields on the march. Anything, any number of things. If you can imagine it, you know, it, 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 it's a possibility, I guess is what I mean to say. But the shields weren't that. They weren't that useful. Or rather, if they had been made, they wouldn't have been terribly useful. And because of that, they wouldn't have been worth it to haul them along, no matter what sort of fancy system could be derived to make it happen. Ultimately, it's the same argument that I made in my longbows versus muskets video, that sure, there are probably all sorts of incredible examples that we can think of where a detachment of shield bearers would be exactly what was needed. It would be, you know, perfect for any one given setting. But despite that, there will be countless more scenarios where the shields are lackluster at best and even an outright burden at worst. And in general, I think that whenever we as students of history think of something that feels like it would be better than what was actually done, well, rather than just assuming that we know best and you know, trying to think of what, like, you know, why they were too stupid to come up with the genius idea that we did and whatnot, we need to ask ourselves, why were things the way that they were? You know, especially in military history with questions like this, when armies actively fought against opponents who may have used the techniques in question, who may, you know, they, they fought against shield-bearing armies in the 18th century at some point or other, uh, and, and especially, you know, even when these armies are coming out of a European tradition that had these elements, that had shields and whatnot in the past, and then abandoned them. It's not like this was an unknown quantity in Europe. It's not like, you know, no one thought of the idea of a shield. The idea was around. So why didn't it carry forward? I believe very, very strongly that no modern person from the most intelligent and well-read of military historians, which I am certainly not, to the most experienced and tactically, uh, uh, you know, minded military veteran, of which I am even further, no matter who you are, none of these people are going to know better than the collective experience and knowledge of over a hundred years of military experience, uh, you know, uh, from, from practi practitioners and theorists both, historically speaking. You know, yes, sure, we can point out countless little flaws from individual officers. Oh, well, if Lieutenant Jacobson went left instead of right, he would have saved the day, blah, 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 blah. Yeah, sure, we can uh, uh, expound endlessly on the failures of particular campaigns and such, but to sit in our ivory towers decrying the simple collective stupidity of quite literally millions and millions of people whose entire lives were dedicated to actually doing this stuff? Well, I mean, that strikes me as rather silly. So the next time you think of something that seems pretty obvious and would revolutionize the way that things were done historically, not just militarily, but in, in any field, economics or, or, or agriculture, whatever it is. Like, oh, why not just do crop rotation? It seems so easy. Try not to make any assumptions on why it wasn't that way. Rather, seek out additional knowledge. Look to more sources, because you may be surprised to learn that 
actually the concept of crop rotation, it did exist and that people were using it. You know, sort of like whenever people talk about light infantry and guerrilla tactics in the American War of Independence, and then they're surprised to hear that, you know, both the British and the American rebels, they were both using them. Or you may just learn that if it wasn't done, maybe there is actually a good reason why that was the case. It's all about giving these historical figures more credit and approaching the logic of a time period with openness rather than dismissal. And that, I think, makes history and the study of history so much more rich and interesting. And, and none of this showboating here at the end is, is to shame or blame any individuals who asked me this question because it's a valid question. It's actually a really good question. Um, and it's a pretty natural line of thinking, I, I think. Uh, as someone learns more and more about the logic behind linear warfare, they think, oh, well, you know, if it's all like this, well, why didn't they do that? That's a natural question to ask. No shame for someone asking a question like that. The only shame comes if they just jump to assumptions and those assumptions are the absolute worst possible thing to assume. Um, you know how I get. I like my soapbox. I like to prattle on. It's just how it goes. At the end of the day, the point is keep on learning, keep on reading. Primary sources are especially important and you'll find a bunch of primary sources provided for free at my website, nativeoak.org, blah, 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 blah. This video has gone on for way too long, but thank you all for watching, and most particularly to this absolutely fantastic list of wonderful people that you are seeing scroll before you now. What makes these individuals so fantastic? Well, the fact that they support my content directly on Patreon and actually made this video possible, because without them, I wouldn't be able to pay my rent. I can hardly do it now. Anyways, if you want to support me too, then you can swing on down to Patreon, check it out, or if you want to watch these videos early while also supporting me and without spending any of your own money, well, you can watch the content early on Recast. Just have to watch an ad there. It pays me an awful lot better than YouTube does. And, you know, it's only one ad as opposed to YouTube's many and uh, no sponsorship message. So there you go. Anyways, thank you so much for your support. And until the next time, my dear viewer, I am and I shall remain your most humble and obedient of servants.